Okay, guys, alternate ending. Take 43. With so many movies on the net and TV, it's kind of hard being up and film savvy. Do you catch a show while you're on the go? And how do you know what to keep or what to throw? How do you know what to keep or what to throw? Tune in, tune in, tune in to Alternate Ending. Tune in, tune in, tune in to Alternate Ending. Welcome to the hosts of Alternate Ending. Welcome to Alternate Ending. We're discovering good movies, one bad movie at a time. I'm film school dropout Robert Jarosinski. Across from me is our casual movie goer, Carrie Jarosinski, and our very own critic in residence, Tim Brayton. With Dunkirk having hit theaters this past weekend, we're taking a look at our top five war movies. But first, Tim, we have a technological first here on we, Alternate Ending. We have, we have used the power of the internet to cause me to be on our podcast, despite the fact that I am in a different state than I don't you guys. like it. I don't it's, like it. It feels very weird. I feel like I, I lack any visual cues to be able to uh, to interact with you guys. So I, I don't know. We'll see how this goes. Well, I, I had the option to have your your face uh, be seen through video, and I chose I chose not to do that. Um, I feel like it's a lot safer for me to put you down here. Sure. Um, when I'm not seeing your reactions. Yeah. What if sure. this starts to get really hostile because uh, you guys aren't in the same room and you start actually, you know, becoming condescending? It is. It is. Know. That's what the internet does. Like when you use a uh, message forum, the fact that you're not like identified as anything other than just a, a random name. Like that's like psychologically, they've proven that that makes people more prone to getting hostile faster. Interesting. Well, TBD on that. TBD. Yes. Well, ha- oh ha- fuck ha- off. Well, that's like, <laughs> see, I can't see your face. I'm like, is there somebody at the door? Are you talking to me? Now I'm nervous. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, had you have you been on uh, f- uh, Facebook or social media? I know you're on Twitter, but if you were on Facebook, you would you would have noticed that um, Carrie has. Uh, developed an avatar for you um, in, in, in lieu of oh. you being here. So you have to check right. that out. And our audience will have to check that out as well, too. I, I have you figured out your uh, password for Facebook yet, Tim? Uh, I am aware of how to log into Facebook, yes. Okay. When, okay. when I log into it, I just see many things, and I do not know what buttons to push to make those things do <laughs> other things. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's talk movies. Let's jump into our worth mentioning segment. What is the worth mentioning segment of the movies we've seen since the last episode? Which are the ones we want to talk about most? They could be great movies. They could be terrible. We share them with you either way. Uh, how many movies care have you seen since the last episode? Tracking. Keep it on track with uh, three. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Tim, how about you, buddy? Uh, you know, I don't have the number in front of me, but I've seen some, maybe even several <laughs> Would you say many? I don't think I could go as far as many. I have not seen many How many, many is movies. a many? I don't even know what that is. I, I would say many is more than several, but fewer than a lot. I think I would agree with that. I'm uh, bringing up the rear with uh, with two, and that's uh, just just barely squeezed in two this week. It's been mm. a it's been a bad week. Care, what did you end up uh, watching this week? So I saw the big sick Tim. Nice. I know. After you so lovingly called it precious, uh, which I wasn't it? sure. Uh, so I, I wish I hadn't talked to you about it right before, just because I really had built it up that it was going to be the favorite movie of my entire oh, no. life. And I know it was really good. It was really good. Like four stars. Good for me. I was expecting awesome. five. Oh, okay. Um, but it was still really, really good. So, uh, Tim talked about it on our episode last week, but in case you missed that one, I'll briefly go through it cause it's still in theaters now. So if you haven't see it, not seen it, we'll, we'll try and sell you on whether or not you should get out there for it. But it's directed by Michael Showalter and written by Emily V. Gordon. It stars Kumail Nanjiani and Zoe Kazan, Holly Hunter, who has an amazing performance. I'm like remembering everything, everything you said <laughs> to him last week. And I'm like, Sounds familiar. Yeah, a little so bit I, of deja vu. For, little deja for, vu. If, if you're listening week to week here. <laughs> so, but it, it was really, really cute. So it's a cute, true story of Kumail Nanjiani and his wife, Emily Gordon's courtship. And uh, so she wrote it, like Tim talked about last week, And but she's not an actress. So well, they got I, this actually, super Actually, I think cute, they co-wrote it. So. I think she was like the main writer. Probably. Yeah. So she he just fun. He just saw, sat back and was like, yeah, that sounds good. Sounds good. That yeah, seems like about let's, let's how it happened. Let's go with the way you have it there. So super cute, it's felt very low budget. Then I read, ran out and read your review online on our website and uh, agreed to, like it felt very low budget to me. Um, 
But uh, it goes through their struggles uh, as a dating couple where they meet and they fall in love. And then there's the whole cultural dis- difference aspect that I really enjoyed. Uh, and then dealing with the failing health of uh, Emily Gordon. And he has to kind of be there for her. There were a couple parts for me that... Okay, so here's what I want to say to you, Tim, about it. Yes. Here's what I didn't like. It was too real. Okay. So it's like it was real life. And so I think sometimes what I like about ro- like little rom-com movies like that is I don't want to know like, you know, that when they were on a break that he did things that he shouldn't have done or whatever. That's not a spoiler. Rob's like giving me the spoiler look. I feel like for someone who's not seen it, the movie, that's... I didn't say what he did. Something. It's not. It's definitely not a spoiler that he does no. things. He does okay. not... He does not enter a cryogenic tube and not do things. No, he doesn't go to Vegas and become a dancer. He doesn't do any of those things. They should do that in the sequel, though. They might. They might do that. I would absolutely pay every penny I had to see the the big slot. The big big slot. Good one. Yeah. No? No. Double Uh, entendre? Double entendre, no. The the bigger sick is clearly where they're going to take the title. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Dang it. I hope so. Much more clever. Much better. But yeah, there were a couple of those things where I was like, I was mad at the characters, but because I know it's a real life story, it was like, well, I guess people might do that. So you're you're not mad at the characters, you're mad at the human beings who made the film and are terrible people. That, I think, is what, that's what happened. But then at the end, yeah, at the end of the day, I had to be like, okay, real life movie, super cute, and would highly, highly recommend people get to theaters and see it like you did. Well, I still need to, so I'll I'll be getting uh, to that as it is uh, one of your top anticipated movies care of the summer. So I need to get out there to see it, to weigh in on it too. But I will be doing that offline. We will not go through it a third time, I promise. I promise you listeners. But, But how will we know what you thought of it? Um, I will uh, write something maybe for once. Right. Maybe it's going to be a five Letterboxd. star for Rob. Five star for sure. Is that what you're, you're feeling? I'm like it more You'll than like everybody? You'll like it more than me. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I think so. We'll see. Tim, how about you? Uh, well, I am going to go with a film that I didn't write about. Uh, it's the only film I saw this week that I didn't write, write about. In fact, uh, it's a 2009 Indonesian action film called Merantau, uh, which is notable primarily for being... The uh, first film that director Gareth Evans made with star, I'm going to butcher his name, Iko Uweis. That's right. And uh, better known by far for their collaborations on The Raid and The Raid 2. But this was the film, this was uh, Evans' first film, it was Uweis' first film. And it's totally obviously like, I found this amazing martial artist and I'm going to put him in a movie and show you guys how amazing he is. And on that level, it's awesome. And if you like the raid, even a tiny bit, I think you should totally see Marantau. Uh, it's not the same, like crazy over the top virtuoso display of the human body being pushed to its limits in the way that the raid films are. So in that respect, I was a little disappointed, but I think I am only disappointed because I know that they would make the raid like later like two or three years later. Where did Uh, you end up seeing this? uh, I got it on disc from Netflix. Um, Okay. It is, as far as I know, not streaming anywhere in this fine world of ours. It might be streaming like to pay on Amazon, but uh, I did get it. I did get it on disc. Uh, It's really good. It's the story of basically this young man who has to go on a walkabout sort of. Uh, It's called Marantau uh, where he has to go and like find his way in the world. and, And it's coming of age in that respect. And he, his coming of age involves uh, breaking up a prostitution ring and making the bad guys pay and making the put upon women like free. So, uh, ah. so a little, little trite, a little cliche, but it is an action movie. Uh, the action sequences are just amazing and they get more amazing as they go along. The climax is in a shipping yard that's just drenched in this cherry red lighting. And it is so beautiful and totally like the whole movie, I was like clearly not loving it the way I wanted to, but by the end, I loved the final action scene. So it's definitely not like an enthusiastic two thumbs up, go see it the second, but definitely if you need to get yourself into a good action movie, it's a really good action movie. Is it like uh, Taken only with karate? Uh, it is. It is not. Um, no. I would not. I would not describe it because it's a different fighting style. So I, I mean, that is what you said with karate, but uh, no, it's it's a lot less emotionally resonant because he's Iko Uwes is just not a terribly good actor he's a terribly good martial artist Tim you might not, not know this about about me but I'm a martial artist I made it all the way to uh, to Greenbelt in my in my youth is, is Greenbelt the second one or the first one <laughs> 
Um, it is, I believe, the third, in, at Ooh. least in the, dis- the discipline that I trained. Um, but I'm actually a big martial arts fan, and having not seen, you mentioned the raid as well in this. Is that something? Have and you the raid not too? seen the raid? Yeah. So is that Robert. you know for, for for people who have not seen the raid who are martial arts fans is this like a must? It uh, is, a, is the if, raid. If you like anything that is anywhere in the vicinity of action cinema, especially martial arts, you need to see the raid. That is now moved to the top of my list. It, um, yeah. Yes. yes okay. It should. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. and I, th- check, this, we have a this we have a review of the raid films on our site that you should read because they are written from a point of extreme enthusiasm. Care martial arts films for yeah, you? You know how I feel about them. No, I, I don't. I don't think we've watched. Uh, I watched Big Trouble. Big in Trouble China. in Little China. That oh, was well, about. That's that. that's different. That's yeah. yeah I mean, that is martial arts. I watched. Uh, what's the one with the the little kid and the old guy with the little skinny beard? The Karate Kid. The karate. Yeah, <laughs> I watched that too. The remake or the original? I watched that. I think. Okay. I liked think- it. I think you need to see at least one martial arts film that was made in an East Asian language before you write them off. All right. Well, you know what? Maybe somebody will, maybe a Patreon will come in on, you, you might, come in on I, that. I might have to Patreon you guys you're to gonna, see the raid, honestly. You're going to Patreon us so that you can get us to see one. It's actually one of our first and only good seg- segues that we've ever done um, because <laughs> the movie that, that Karen and I uh, ended up watching um, as well was a, a Patreon request by Julian DeBerry, which we finally tracked down. And we also sent away for it on Netflix because we did not want to pay $70 on, on for a Blu-ray. Or nineteen ninety nine. Well, well, apparently yeah. it's nineteen. $99. Well, we discovered the seventy dollars was for the import from Japan. Well, if I'm going to get something, I'm going to get the You're quality. Do it right. I'm going right? to go all the way. And to be fair, the Japanese Blu-ray has an amazingly beautiful cover. So that's you should go Rob right. cares about that a lot. But this is this is one that for us, um, I think you know, our first attempt into anime with uh, Paprika, uh, we were we, we 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 did not fall in love with anime because of that. So this was Julian's. Uh, attempt as well to expose us to something that was a little bit more easygoing as an entry level uh, for kind of a, s- someone immature t- in, in the anime realm. Uh, so we ended up seeing Spirit Away, which it's two hours, one minute. IMDb gives it an 8.6. Rotten Tomatoes, 97%. Directed by, I'm assuming, the famous, uh, I'm going to get the name wrong. Uh, Hayao. Hayao. Hayao, uh, Hayao Miyazaki. Hayao Miyazaki. Yeah. Miyazaki. Good one. Yeah. Ha- Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, yes. Oscar winner for best animated feature as well too. So only really, only non-American film to win that award. Wow. So highly regarded film. So I understand why this would be if you're if we're going to get uh, get us exposed to you know one anime film. This this would probably be the one to either make like you said Tim or break uh, break us. Um, movies about uh, family moves to the suburbs. Uh, a ten year old girl. You can tell it's a little bit. I, I, Chihiro. Yeah, I was actually feeling like it was Inside Out at the beginning. I was like, oh, this is kind of like Inside Out. I like did she's not feel moving. like that at all. No, no, no. In the sense where it's a young girl who's displaced. Her family is moving her unwillingly oh, to another. Oh, Inside Out. I was inside out. Up, up. No, no, no. Like, inside Out. Okay. And they they stop over. Um, they're trying to get to their house. They take a little bit of a wrong turn. And these uh, these the parents, which are just hilarious. I'm, I'm watching the dad like drag them through this this haunted house of a th- of a thing to get to the other side, and they enter this kind of fantasy realm. And she has to go on this journey to ultimately rescue her parents from 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 the, from the from beasts, demons from demons that that live there too. Care, what did you what did you think about this movie? I liked this significantly better than Paprika. I can safely say that too, and no I knock, agree. no knock to uh, Caleb Wimble, also Patreon, who signed us uh, that as well too. No, but, but I think this he one even was, knew. One, he even said he was this like, "This one oh, went down smoother." This one was a much smoother. Uh, he even knew he was like, "I should have started you more entry level uh, than Paprika," but yeah, I you know this one was a lot easier viewing. Uh, the storyline was comprehensible, and. Uh, Still, although it was simpler, a lot of open questions for me. A lot of things. I think you. Really? It, well, and so this is a question to you, Tim. So, yeah, I feel like the entire time I'm watching it, there's all this symbolism that's happening. You know, there's like heads with no bodies floating around. Like that's supposed to be something and well, mean something, and I don't know what it means. It's not symbolism per se. A lot of the creatures in Spirited Away are taken from traditionally traditional Japanese folklore. So they are, instead of like werewolves and witches on broomsticks and things like that, that you'd see if it was set in Europe, yeah. you have all of these demons and monsters that to a Japanese audience would just be like, oh, well, there's, you know, whatever the name of that demon is. Sure. Uh, so it's, I mean, it does assume that the audience is going to know those by sight, but I mean, that's 
I think basically all you need to know to get along is that she's in the world of like fairy tale monsters. Yeah. Well, and I guess when I first started off, I didn't know that at first because you're not explicitly told. But at the beginning, I thought maybe she was imagining all of this. And so because she was imagining, I thought maybe all these characters were representative of people that she knew. So Um, like Wizard of Oz. Yes. And so like the the guy with all the arms that says this is my granddaughter. I was like, is this her grandfather? I don't know who that was. Oh, he was trying to k- kind of keep her safe, like give an explanation as to why human is in this in this world. I don't. I, I, he was trying to cover for her. Oh, That's he was. Kinda what I got. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, th- there were a lot of parts where I felt like I was thinking uh, quite a bit throughout the movie. At the same time, too, it's a movie that I think if you like anime, I can see why everybody would love it. It was it was sweet. And does does every anime Tim have the, like a fantastical element? Because I will say that is the one. Not. Okay, because I I mean. F- um, Paprika had that as well too. More of us. That was more sci-fi uh, kind of fantasy as well. But um, the, this one heavy on the fantasy side. Yeah, the anime that tends to be successful in the states does tend to have a significant sci-fi or fantasy element. Just because in the West we're con- like we look at animation and we think, oh, it has to do something spectacular and weird and otherworldly. Otherwise, why is it animated? So what tends to hit best in the in this country are those kinds of things. But um, actually, Miyazaki's most recent and potentially last film, although probably not, is like a very straightforward biopic of the man who invented a certain plane that was used by Japanese pilots in World War II. So it is entirely possible for anime to have very straightforward real world plots, and they very frequently do. They just don't tend to be super popular in the States when that's the case. I, th- I think that's what I need to see. I think, and. Uh, you need American anime? No, I, I just need a simple story. I yeah. think what, what's tripping me up on these is the fantasy. It's too fantasy for me. You yeah. can't suspend I, your I disbelief. I just don't care. <laughs> like, and I oh, have see, a I way. care. But no, she I care. is so delightful. She I mean, is delightful, yeah. She is a real world human being thrust into a fantasy world. It's not like she's a fantasy world character. Right. Here's a question for you, too. Yes. So this is my last uh, two mini questions. Are the, the casting for Chihiro and Sen are two different people? Why they're so she becomes Sen, right? He says you're Sen now, and he changes her name. Why would you have to have two different castings? Wait, for, is, is that true? I, I think so. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, on, check I don't. me like while I'm rambling about something I'm, else. Look I'm this up because that doesn't feel doesn't feel right. Uh, gonna, I wonder if it's a difference in the Japanese versus the American versions. Because there was Hag- there was an American um, d- dubbing done so oh. I, don't know if I don't know in both cases though it seems like it's the same character same voice it's uh davi chase in the american dub and it doesn't look like there was someone different for sen uh and yeah rumi and- hiraji oh um what what that is uh that's she was the japanese voice artist and davi chase was the american voice oh artist. okay got it got so, yeah, it, so got there, it. there were two different characters who played or two different actors who played the character based on which language you watched got it got it got it okay yeah oh you know what overall i'm really glad i saw this because i think it made me realize that there's more to it than you know and i, I, liked I, I did too and I, I for me it was more that i am now i i can sa- more safely put to rest like you're off anime, anime is just it's, it's just not, one of those things it's, it's just thing. one of those things yeah i just and i feel bad saying it because a lot of the you should uh, the, because it's great art what well, i know and i i love we overlapped him on so much with julian i've seen his picks before too with uh, with caleb we overlap on so many things this is just one of those things that um or one of those areas where i just don't it just i don't Does get it, it. Sure. i just don't get it it's like war movies for me yeah hey oh hey, that, that's uh, a segue hey. also <laughs> <laughs> Uh, remember, you could find yeah. I'll just I'll just get right into our segue then. Uh, remember, you could find more details about all the movies we've watched at our website alternating.com. That's alternating.com. Before we head to our break, you might be wondering about ways to support the show. Direct from our website, you can head over to our Patreon page, which provides you access to a ton of perks. You may want to make us watch a movie, just like Julian did. Have Tim write a review. Pick your own episode topic. You can do it all from our Patreon page, just like Travis did as well, who picked up our Golden Glow package, entitling him to uh, uh, worth mentioning a tim review and control over one of our episodes so a little bit of a a teaser into what that's going to be uh for worth mentioning um picked a movie for us care called stop making sense i'm not familiar with that oh it's it is a it's like the concert documentary it's a uh jonathan demi film about the talking heads about talking heads there's no the that was very bad of me uh it's a concert documentary about talking heads in 1984 i think and it is like the best concert film ever 
All right. Yeah. Yeah. Something new for us. I see. I love that the audience is I exposing know, us, I taking the time to expose. Uh, Tim, a review for you, Blowout. So maybe something you uh, haven't got to. I have review. not, in fact, ever seen Blowout. I have. I have. <laughs> when you have kids, Tim, you'll know. You'll I, know what it is. I, I think that you might be lying <laughs> to me right now. <laughs> you'll find out. And then it's our a, a whole episode. So uh, uh, Travis wanted us to dedicate an entire spoiler alert episode to talking about a matter of life and death. So a movie I'm unfamiliar with, and I'm sure, Carrie, you haven't seen either? No. Have I, you, Tim? I have seen it, and it is good. And that is all I'll say about it, because we're de- uh, dedicating an episode to it. Nice. Well, I want to thank all of our listeners as well who support the show and make their Amazon purchases uh, through our site. Doing it is easy. Just go to our website, alterending.com. Click on our Amazon banner and seamlessly go about your purchases. All proceeds go to making our show better. Since our last episode, we've had a ton of purchases. So I'm just going to try to get through these as quickly as possible. A couple of books purchased, Somewhere in the Night, Film Noir in the American City. Someone nice. catching up. Oh, you know that one? I, I've heard of it. I haven't read okay. it. Okay. Someone catching up on the Valerian series, um, volumes two and three of the complete collection. So they must already have volume one. Catching up for the movie. I, for the I movie. did, and I wanted to buy it before the movie came out. And I was like, well, Rob will talk about me if I buy it through our site. <laughs> you this, can, now you can you? borrow it this from me. whoever it is. Oh, it is you. Nice. It's totally you. me. Oh, I, mean, I don't you know. to be maybe, talked about on the show. Maybe your multiple own show. people bought volumes two and three, but if only one did, it was me. This is probably Tim as well, a uh, privacy screen protector for his uh, for his phone, so that people can't uh, see when he's watching porn on his uh, on his mobile. Oh, no, I don't want I want people to know it. <laughs> he's very open I about it. Talk about it out loud, like I'm on the bus and I'm like, all right, everybody, porn time. That's what, Who wants that's to what he's around? doing. He he does that during the episodes. I look over and that's what he's doing. This is interesting. Some some um, diabetic crew socks. So these are socks designed for for folks with um, uh, with diabetes. So it's it's, the, it's the less um, less binding on the sure. uh, on around the ankles. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, Computers, uh, TP-Link, 300 megabits per second wireless uh, modem router. Um, We could probably be using that if if things fail for us on the Skype side. A six-foot HDMI cable purchase, Panasonic Pro Individual Cell Battery Charger. Can't have your cell battery run out on you. No. Um, Home purchases as well. Blackout, room darkening curtains. We need those We need those really bad. Room darkening curtains are the best thing in the world. We need those. Our Our kids kids are up like last night. Last night, speaking of crack of dawn, Alice was up at midnight. That's not even a time to be awake. She was awake. That's a time that children ought to be (laughs) dreaming of. She was like ready to go. And Rob's like, oh, Carrie, sorry. I didn't realize you were up there for two and a half hours with her. I didn't realize while I was asleep. So <laughs> I, pre- I pretend. Yeah, yeah I, pretend I know not you to do. Know. Don't think I don't know. We had some frames purchase, uh, picture frames purchase as well. Some cool. uh, wipe your paws, natural rubber doormat um, purchase for animals there. Uh, curtain rods, probably for the blackout, uh, curtains. blackout, blackout curtains. curtains. Adjustable bracket, draper rod, also probably for the curtains. Another minimalism book. I, this must be a, a theme here. Uh, Kindle, Kindle book, minimalism, lo, live a meaningful life. So uh, people loving that. Tim, I see that you bought your microphone that you're using now uh, through our Amazon site. It sounds good. I, I can indeed. hear you too. You still sound very uh, smooth and buttery as I, usual. I am. I do my best. I know. I'm currently we, actually completely nude, rubbing oil on my voice. My, my throat, uh, so. You're actually. You didn't realize that you actually hit the camera on, so you actually. <laughs> <laughs> we had a Roku Express HD streaming player. Catch all your uh, streaming uh, content that way. A lot of pet supplies. Bark's original pet seat cover. Don't want to get the pet fur on the seats there. Blueberry pet six color classic staple stripe genuine dog collar. Uh, pet feeding mat. Another uh, silicone one purchase. So people must be enjoying those. I think that's the second week in a row we've had that purchase. Appreciate that. Extra large seven inch thick orthopedic memory foam dog bed. Ooh, those are those are pricey. That's a good pet owner yeah, thanks too. For, yeah, you yeah. care about your pet. I appreciate that. A uh, fur mover uh, broom with squeegee. Um, American Those work. Those work yeah. totally well. Goodbye. We need that too. That we need one of those. You don't have for what for the for the girls' uh, knots in their hair. I thought you said a squeegee mop. Yeah, no, uh, it's, it's, a, a, it's a squeegee for hair, and they work surprisingly well. I've never heard of this, but well, we'll be googling it's like, it. It's not like for for like it's not like a comb. It's like when the animal sits on the couch and leaves hair behind. Oh, this is you for pets. You squeegee it off, or, or oh, if your okay. child sheds. I'm not going right. to say. <laughs> well, I mean, Rob, I don't know. I don't want to say anything, but. Uh, speaking of taking care of your pet, um, this this pet eats better than I do. Uh, we have a uh, grain, real lamb, and sweet potato dry dog food. Gluten so, free. Uh, Gluten free. Yeah. Nice. Care about your kids or your your pet's diet. Um, this is interesting. Funko Pop Television Twin Peaks Laura Palmer character action figure. Tim, oh, Tim is that is this you, buddy? That's Tim. I, I do not buy the Funko Pops, but I support those who do very very much. 
very much in, in alignment with your Twin, Twin Peaks series that's going yes. on right now, too. Well, because Twin Peaks is, is a happening right now. It is. Out in the world. Uh, I saved DVDs for last, Tim, so that you could give us the nod on, on what you think about some of these. Uh, right. I'm unfamiliar with a bunch. Um, we talked about Batman, but this is the Batman complete television series on Blu-ray. Oh, nice I, choice. Nice choice. I heard that's good. It is good. I, uh, I have not personally purchased it, but it's been staring me in the face every time I log into Amazon. Really great, like, satiric, campy superhero serial from the 60s that for a long time was what people thought of when they thought of Batman. So it's it's really good. Also had Martin Scorsese's World Cinema Project number two purchased. Not familiar with oh, that. Oh, it's a Criterion set that has, um, I believe, six just well-regarded international films that have been restored. And I've seen, I think from volume two, I think I've seen one of them. Uh, so, but it's Criterion Collection, so you know it's got to be at least a little good. Looks like in preparation for our Spirited Away conversation, someone picked up that Blu-ray for nineteen ninety-nine. It nice. wasn't the uh, seventy dollars. Big spenda. Yeah. Big spend also, the Oceans trilogy. Little Steven uh, getting Steven Soderbergh maybe getting ready for Logan. Logan you know, Lockyer. I, I saw that that was available during uh, Prime Day, so probably someone snatched it up at the, the tail end of Prime Day. Nice. Also, Planet of the Apes on Blu-ray, Samurai Jack Season 1, the Spider-Man trilogy, uh, as we were talking about our top five superhero movies, and the films of Michael Powell, A Matter of Life and Death, Stairway to Heaven, Lord of the Rings, Motion Picture Trilogy, good pickup there. We have a couple Lord of the Rings posters here in our basement, and then the Marx Brothers Silver Screen Collection as well. Uh, I, I, I got to get into the Marx Brothers. I think I would like that. You do. They're good. They're and Tim, good. you might have to help us out with this one, DVD, Wolf Children. Oh, it's an anime film. Um, oh, nice. Another I have anime. not seen it. I've heard extraordinarily good things, and I like the director a lot, whose name I will not be able to pronounce, but he's very good. Well, thank you all for your purchases. When we get back, our top five war movies. Welcome back to Alternate. We're talking about our top five war movies. A lot of debate care about uh, on social media, on our website, mm-hmm. about what is, what qualifies as a war movie. Yeah, so I wouldn't have thought it was difficult to qualify because you would just say a movie in which a war is either taking place or has taken place and people are talking about it. But when I actually started to put it down on paper, I had a lot of criteria. So here's what they are. So I don't like war movies, just as a fly on this, so leading into this. So I don't think any of ours are going to line up. I'm just going to call that right now. All right. Agree to disagree. I think we're going to line up. You think so? Yeah, I think so. All Um, right. At least one. So for me, you had to have been post-revolutionary war. I think that's legitimate. I think that a thing like Braveheart looks like a war movie, but it also is so different. Yeah. And you have... Exactly. And you have like war started with man. So it's like, I don't want to go back to like gladiator movies and whatever. Otherwise, like if I could have picked any are, war are movie. Are you saying I, that, that human beings are not present in the movie gladiator? I'm, I'm, thrown. I'm, not, I'm not sure what your point is. <laughs> no, I'm saying like the timing gladiators old. It's pre revolutionary war. Right. But when, oh, you, when you say war started with man is what how? men I, are, I men mean, are in gladiator. I'm saying there've been, no, I'm saying there've been, no, different criteria so two separate criteria right there one is i want to like date qualify this so that's not like any time there was ever a war oh, oh, ever. oh so because war is as old as human civilization you exactly know. Okay. thank uh-huh. you i can see now that that was unclear so that's what that's part of it and then pre it has to be pre 9 11 okay. is my other criteria oh interesting that's yeah. just arbitrary so i know why you did it makes sense to do that okay. yeah uh so i did that and then um, I think I had another criteria. I think you had to have something lovey in there. I realized, like, I only love, like, romantic war movies. Okay. You didn't have to have a... That gives you just, extra it points. It just broke out that way. It broke out that way. Well, those me. are the movies of the ones that fit then. Then, So how are you... Um, esca- like, how do these get elevated to, for those few remaining, <laughs> that would meet that random criteria? I mean, at, at this um, point, I'm hearing that Captain Corelli's Mandolin is her number one film. <laughs> And I actually only have one, and that is it. So I only have watched one movie. So, so those are my criteria. Okay. Is it? Are your is your criteria the same, Tim or Rob? Um, well, my I didn't really go in with like criteria. It happens to be the case that all of my picks are combat films from twentieth century combat. Uh, I didn't set out to do that. It just sort of broke down that way. Um, 
I'd say for me, a war movie is a film in which war and its effects is the primary focus, not just a, a movie in which war happens. So like in Forrest Gump, we see Vietnam, but it's not yeah. a movie about Vietnam. So it's not a war movie. I would argue, and I didn't put this movie on my list because it's terrible and I hate it. Uh, there's a 1944 film called Since You Went Away or the 1943 film, 42 film, Mrs. Miniver is kind of the same thing. Uh, films that are about war as it affects um, the, civiliz- the the citizens who are not at war, like the people on the home front. And for me, I, again, I didn't have to think about these because they were never going to make my list. I would say that does not qualify as a war film because the war is a concept in those. It's not a physically present sure, thing. Sure, sure. So those I'd are probably, those are my, my requirements is that it, it be about war and that the war be something that we can look at and hear and see and touch and smell. Okay, that makes sense. Which I, is, think, which I think is why I ended up with combat films exclusively. Uh, you did a much more concise way, Tim. I think that's where I ended up landing too is because we could have went uh, Star Wars. You know, exactly. We could have went. We could have went Star Wars. Is is the battle scene between Avatar and Avatar? Is that a war between civilizations? Right. I would have gone Lord of the Rings too. Yeah, I mean, um, Hotel Rwanda. You know, is you know, uh, uh, battle between war between two similar or the same race I, of, of you know to, what I mean? Like to me, Avatar and Hotel Rwanda both sort of end up in the same like. It's not a war. It's a butchering of a weak population by a strong population, which I don't know. Feels different to me somehow. Yeah, and I agree. So I, I excluded those things. So Maybe I, we I, will, I know. I, I went to Wikipedia, and they simply say war film is a film. They actually have a definition for war film. It's a film genre concerned with warfare, typically about naval air or land battles, with combat scenes central what, to the what drama. What other do you have besides naval air and land? Like space. 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 Yeah, which is why, I uh, honestly, I, I, I saw people you know writing in some some space-related movies, and I get it. They have their place. They're great, they're great uh, combat drama as well, too, but not... I, I have in my mind. I'm picturing men, at, you know, men are, and women in arms, um, traditional like battles, uh, historical battles, and I wanted them to all be historically present. I wanted them to be on Earth. Um, Is there a time element for you? Um, I ended up looking at my list. I went to go see if it was if it was all 20th century. No, I have some 19th century and 21st century. Um, all wars right. Here. All right. So, all right. Let's let's get so going. Let's start. Okay, right. kick us off. This one is on neither of your lists, uh, and I, you're going to judge me, I can tell, but it's the 2000 movie, The Patriot. Not on my list. It Tim? Is, it is not on my list, and I am judging you, so so two and for two. <laughs> <laughs> two, for two. We're lining up on, uh, on something. So it's written and directed, or no, it's just uh, directed by Roland Emmerich and written by Robert, is it Robert Roday, Robert Rodat? I actually, I, I think it's Rodé. I'm not sure. Rodé. Uh, so he did Thor, too. I don't know if you know he that. He did, yeah. Yeah. Uh, stars Mel Gibson, who's not my favorite. Heath Ledger, who is my favorite. Jolie Richardson, who I like. And Jason Isaacs, who is the guy that plays the giant turd bag in that movie. I don't know if you remember him. But he always plays well, a really good yeah, bad he's, guy. Uh, he's Harry Potter's enemy's dad, right? Is that... In the Harry Potter oh, movies. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Draco's. Like Draco's su- dad. Draco's Sucko dad. Malfoy. What's his name? Oh, Lucien. yeah. Lucien Malfoy. Which is a throwback to our Planet of the Apes episode right. last week, right? Uh, so, okay. So, the plot of this movie, this is from 2000, so it's an oldie uh, and a you goodie and for some of us. You oldie the same way. Old, it's a semi-oldie. So, I saw this in theaters, and... It's a story of Benjamin Martin, who's in South Carolina, and he, I think he served in the French and Indian War. So he served in previous wars and I think was really like killed a lot of people, was really bad. And so he left that all behind to go live this country life. And then the American Revolution comes and he gets basically called up. He has to get called up to fight, and it's a story. Something happens uh, in his own family, a loss of his own family that compels him to fight. I actually haven't seen this in 17 years, but I remember being really compelled by this when I saw it 17 years ago, which would have made me very young at the time. But um, here's what I liked about this movie. So this doesn't have the classic uh, romantic battle that I was looking for, but what it does have is he comes up then and he has to pull together this band of like 
I don't know what you'd call them. Unqualified. Brothers. Yeah, vet, brothers. Uh, brothers and, brothers. and sisters. Band of brothers. He, so he has like this makeshift militia where he pulls together peasants and slaves and all these people of, that aren't meant to be fighting, like a bunch of randoms. And he pulls them together to come together and fight back in this rebellion. And a story like that will get me every time. Like where the underdog rises up to fight back. And, uh, and that's why I love this movie. Sure. Like I, I've, I've only seen so this like, one time. Sure. I don't know. I don't harbor any bad feelings toward this movie one way or yeah. the other. I don't remember it being good. I don't remember it being bad. I remember Mel Gibson in a ponytail, and that's pretty much it. And I remember a young like Mel Gibson. I remember though. like a young drummer boy. Was there a young drummer boy? There was like, taken I by the imagine. redcoats. Yeah, okay. there were some red coats. Tim, just as a side note, whenever your voice goes up like three <laughs> octaves, uh, I can tell you're being nice to me. I, so uh, I I find the movie to be sort of morally objectionable is the thing and i don't want to like bring no, it you up. can tell me why you well, can tell me why because that's the thing i haven't seen it in so many years that when i did see it i'm sure i had no idea of and that so what was the thing that was it, morally it's, so objectionable? It's, it's part of mel gibson's weird thing that he's been doing for most of his career where he likes playing characters who undergo like extreme physical suffering and I don't have a problem with that per se. Um, I think he does it better in other films. And in this particular film, when you combine it with the liberties taken with history, which it's it's going somewhat out of its way to make the British seem more sadistic and murderous and nasty than sure. they were. And I, just, I find the whole thing to be sort of violence porn-y a little bit. Was it really like, violent? I remember it being violent. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen it in a lot of years. Um, I just, I remember it being sort of like, look at all this awful human suffering that we're going to just gloat over because it's awesome and Mel Gibson is covered in blood. And it's like, oh, oh, maybe not. Yeah, again, again. My big problem with your pick here is that I believe you said you're going to stick in the 1900s. I said said revolutionary. Oh, post-revolutionary. Yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry, Mm -hmm. Rob. All right. Didn't catch me yet. You probably will, though. (laughs) You probably will. Technically, it's not (laughs) post-revolutionary. Technically, it's intra-revolutionary intra so that's what i meant when i said that earlier and just as a fly i don't know if you guys are also uh knowing this i am not a history buff so you guys just take it away on all those pieces so anyway so that kicks it to i will say this about the patriot shot by caleb deschanel it's an extraordinarily beautiful movie you see there's other merits too that's how i get to 7.2 on imdb that and, seems uh, high. That's got to be one of the higher roles. So high. Films. It's really high. Mel Gibson paid for extra votes, I think, on that. But um, but anyway, so that kicks it to your number five, Tim. Sure. Uh, so my number five is not quite as much of an old school classic as yours. Uh, mine is from 1951. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it is a film called The Steel Helmet, written and directed, I think written, definitely directed by Sam Fuller, uh, who is himself a World War II combat veteran. Uh, it is the first movie about the Korean War. It came out within, I believe, eight months of the Korean War starting. And it is the story of this group of American soldiers who've gotten sort of separated from the main main body of uh, the American forces and find themselves taking shelter in a Buddhist temple that's been abandoned for who knows how long. And basically just them trying to survive long enough to be rescued or kill their pursuers and escape. Um, So really, really straightforward, really short. It's basically a B-movie. It was made for very little money, not by a major studio. But because of Sam Fuller's combat experience, um, I think it has what are, by 1951 standards, just an incredibly honest assessment of what, what is it like to be in war? What does it mean like to be one of these soldiers? And so in a lot of films in that period, you know, we're only six years away from the end of World War II, we're still very heavily invested in, you know, brave American boys out there fighting the the forces of communism and all that. And you have this movie about, like, these people are terrified and they are suffering and they do not want to be there. And being there will kill them. And that's that. And to have that level of just rawness in an American film of 1951 period, but certainly a film about America's military efforts in 1951, is just really an amazingly striking thing. And it just, it feels so authentic to me. And I think that's what Sam Fuller brings to, he's, he did a couple other war movies later. Um, and I think all of them share that feeling of just like totally unsentimental, I don't care about heroism, I don't care about bravery, I care about like these men being scared shitless and how they're dealing with that 
And to me, that's just really much more rewarding than a lot of, of the other sort of war movies going around in the same period. And again, this is the first Korean war movie. So like that takes some balls to be out to go out there and be like, nope, this war sucks. And look at what it's doing to these guys. It's it's funny you say that. Um, I'm trying to think, I can, I don't know the reasons for this. I'm, I'm more of a history buff maybe than Kara, but I don't know why. You're definitely more of a Okay, thank buff. you, Kara. I didn't yeah. want to I didn't want to. I'll just throw that out there. You know what? You just take that uh, accolade there. Why? Why? I have it other than MASH, you know, I don't know much, many movies that take place as the, with the Korean War as the backdrop. And I don't know if you know, Tim, why that is. And I, I guess in American war know. history, it's not as, it's the forgotten war sometimes. Yeah, um, I think, I think the thing with Korea, we didn't win it. So it's, it's got that like Vietnam-esque, we don't like to talk about it in our pop culture because it doesn't have a happy ending. But unlike Vietnam, it wasn't really a huge deal that we didn't win it. Like it wasn't a cultural defining event. It was just like that two and a half year war that we probably shouldn't have gotten in. Oh, well, the end. Um, so I don't think it has like a mythology attached to it. It's not the good war, like World War II, and it's not the great like loss of the boomer generation. So I think that's the thing. It's just, it's not something that has the kind of mythological stories that filmmakers like to gravitate towards when they're making uh, making um, films. And of course, MASH was itself an allegory for Vietnam. So even though it was set in Korea, it was very clearly yeah. trying to make the audience think about Nam. Mm-hmm. Well, I went, um, we got different, um, different, different centuries, takes. different centuries right. in each of our first picks here. Cause I went with uh, one that took place in the 1800s. I'm talking about, one of my top five um, racial unity movies, I think. I don't know where. I can't remember where it ended up, but it was pretty high up on the list. I'm talking about 1989's Glory. I don't know how I knew that Glory was going to be on your list, but I would have been really disappointed if it wasn't somewhere. Good. Well, I'm glad. It, and that's that's genuine, Tim. I can't see this the sarcastic look, perhaps, on your face. It's, it's, no, I mean, I'm glad that you put it on your list. I It would not be on mine and is not on mine. Okay. But I'm glad yeah, it's this, on yours. This is one. characteristic. I, yeah, it is very char- characteristic <laughs> myself. It's uh, mainly being the time period, 1989. Like I'm, you know, young, really getting into movies at this at this time, and the acting in this, particularly from Denzel Washington. It stars Matthew Broderick, Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, Carrie Elwes, um, and and Andre Brower. But the performances by Denzel, Morgan, um, and really the whole cast is really good. But it won it won Denzel Best Supporting uh, Actor, uh, young. Uh, early in his career as well too directed by ed ed zwick who's uh familiar with doing a lot of uh, war movies uh if you consider legends of the fall a war movie uh courage uh, under fire as well you do you legends uh, of the fall no i no. think that's I the no I I yeah I, I don't either uh, some people uh i think we had a couple of people write that one in the siege as well too so he knows how to do action um fairly well um, but that's not really the centerpiece of this, although it, there are some larger larger scenes, big troops, um, you know, some battle scenes, obviously, as well, too. But really, it's the focus of, of the racism, um, not necessarily even by the Confederates to the Union, but really more of trying to deal with uh, the first all-black volunteer company and led by Matthew Broderick's character. So excited to be getting his first post as um, to lead a platoon um, and um, not not ending up being super thrilled that it's necessarily it's that it's an all-black volunteer group um, but yeah it deals with a lot of elements uh, ended up winning three Oscars and listeners row uh, row three uh, Mary Yarwood and uh, Brian also Why picked can't this. I picture Matthew Broderick as like a, a war hero because he looks like he's six years old even I like think now that's it yeah I don't know. Which, which was actually fitting for the character, too, I think. Kind of like fish out of water. Like he didn't um, probably had the, the know-how and the brains, but just looked did not look the part, which, you know, you're getting all these men to try to follow you and, yeah. into battle and get their gain their respect. Um, so that's part of the storyline is that he looks like a six-year-old a yes, little bit. Kind okay. of, well, kind of. yeah. I don't know if the look is as much as just being like... The callowness. He's, you know, he's yeah. the, the young, untested, fresh-faced youth. All right. Um, I think... The interesting thing about Glory to me, uh, not a movie I love. I think it's a movie that makes some weird choices. Like it's one of those strange films that are like super excited about having a racial theme and then sort of forgetting that they have a white protagonist. Uh, the thing that strikes me about it, it's really the only Civil War combat film. Like hmm. we don't, there are just not that many movies about the Civil War, which is weird because it's like the defining event of 19th century America. And it's just barely ever touched in cinema. Did you and ever that, see uh, Birth of a Nation? Isn't I have seen Birth War? of a Nation. That well, Birth of a Nation is a Civil War movie, and uh, there's some fighting. 
are you talking about the old birth of a nation or the new birth of a nation i was talking about the new one the new one is is prior to the civil war oh it's, it is it's a slave okay. rebellion the, it's the old up. one that is an insanely racist like diatribe against reconstruction uh is is set during the civil war but also is of very little interest to anyone who's not a film historian so yeah i don't want to say that you don't what because it's crazy racist one thing too about uh, glory that that happens every time I see, and I've seen it multiple times, is I well up. Um, the score in it is yes. I, I find to be beautiful, and again, those performances bring out uh, tears. And you know, does this troop end up being unified and fighting together? We'll see. Maybe, maybe if you see it. If you haven't seen it, I, I highly recommend checking it out. So that yeah, that's my number yeah, five. That's a, that's a James Horner score, I might add. So there you go. Would not be surprised if James Horner. Well, actually, did he do any war movies? We might see another James Turner film crop up at some point. We'll see. So that kicks it to my number four. I don't know if I said this in my criteria, but if I didn't earlier, there's a little bit of a criteria add. So it also... The, the war combatants need to make love, I think is what you said. It needs to be a you, love you war You said movie. that it needs to just be about all kinds <laughs> yeah. of beautiful gay sex between soldiers. <laughs> so, okay, then I guess I did cover my criteria for the next one, uh, which is why I've gone with the 2008 The Reader. Interesting uh, choice. Directed by Stephen Daldry, written by David Hare. Did Denial? Did one of you guys talk about Denial recently? I certainly did. I haven't, still haven't seen. Oh it yeah, now. I talked about yeah, Denial. Yeah, you did. He he directed Denial because I remember I was going to make a joke about like the river in Egypt, and I didn't. With Rachel Weisz, Denial. Interesting. I okay. think so. Yeah. So he did that too. Uh, so this stars. It, one of the other reasons I wanted to talk about this is if people did miss this, I know it's from 2008, but I don't feel like everybody saw this. And if you didn't see it, this was so good. It stars Kate Winslet, Ray Fiennes, Bruno Ganz, uh, David Cross uh, is in it as well. It takes place in 1995, but it's a German man played by Ray Fiennes is reminiscing about a relationship he had when he was a teenager in 1958 with an older woman played by Kate Winslet. And she at the time, I think, was in her 30s. So I think he was like 15. She was 30. Not an ideal situation. But uh, he also is remembering what happened during that time. And at the time, she is a... This takes place in during World War II. She's a German, uh, like, what is she, Rob? She's, she's like German. a German. She's German. Well, no, but I mean, like, she's a German, uh, like, concentration she's camp. Cam- I think she's a camp. She's a guard. 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 Yes, a guard. And so, at now, fast forward, after the war is over, she's up uh, and being held for war crimes for the stuff that she did. And the story is really compelling. And I loved this movie. Like, I thought it was drama. It was romance. It was war. Yeah, the war piece. Where where does the war piece happen? She's, I like this movie. She's but, up for she's committing war crimes during World War II, and it takes place during the war when the flashbacks happen during, you know, there's war going on in the flashbacks and stuff. <laughs> we, we see footage that is war adjacent. Yeah. I'm not going to disagree with that. There's definitely war adjacentness, and uh, World War II is definitely just all over the place. And yeah. This is a movie that I would like to call out that if a person hasn't seen it, uh, and you, I think it's one that everyone would, would like. I don't know. What yeah, did you I, think about I, I you like the, it? I like the tension. Oh, yeah, I, go ahead, Tim. I would like to point out that not everyone who has seen this movie would like it. And that is that, and you can read my review of it on this site. And that is so, what I'll say about that movie. <laughs> you, see, what? Come on, man. I, I like this movie. I don't find it to be a war movie, but I really like I do Gosh. like this movie. I, I thought the tension was interest. It was great, and it, oh, and it always Winslet is so good. It's come up a couple times on on the podcast. Is it raises the question: What would you do? And if you, yeah. were, we came up on our last. I like episode, what would you do? I what like, would you do if you had to be in these circumstances? What would you do would if you, you follow, were a? Would you just follow orders? A child, uh, you know. Uh, oh, I would a relationship with a child. I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd make it with. Uh, he was kind of old. He was like fifteen. I'd but make it with. Uh, You'd make Kate it with a fifteen-year-old boy. With an old Kate Winslet. I don't think I... <laughs> you get him there. I uh, I don't know if I would with an, a young Kate Winslet, but an old Kate Winslet. She's really smoking these days. Um, but I can't think of anything that Kate Winslet's been in that's been bad. I, I challenge you there. I would, I would consider that you might need to think a little harder, but we'll... The, I'll think about. I'll go read your review of this movie. And movie forty three, whatever that thing was. That I think that would certainly be a, a key. key <laughs> There's been lots of good ones. Oh, she's been, been lots in, of good ones. She's been in more good than bad. I agree. Hundred percent agree with that. So that is my sultry battle calm 
or battle romance uh, I think, number I think four. Battlecom works. I think we'll stick to Battlecom. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this is battle comedy. It was definitely not comedy, but it was it was good. So uh, that kicks it to your number four, Tim. It does. And uh, this is the one film on my list that I think there's actually a pretty decent possibility one or both of you have seen. Uh, it's the only one of my five that I think that's true for. Uh, I am referring to the best World War II combat film from 1998, Best Picture nominee that very contentiously lost Best Picture to Shakespeare in Love. I am, of course, referring to The Thin Red Line by Terrence Malick. Damn it. Yes. No. Damn. You took my number two. I took your number. I, I really I did not expect anyone was going to have this on their list. Yeah. So I think we've talked about how Terrence Malick I don't get. This is one of his few movies I get, and it's beautiful. It, it is, is gorgeous the, to look at. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. The scene where it's the opening shot of the movie where we hear this low drone and you see an alligator slide into pond scum is like the moment that made me a cinephile. Like I was sitting there in the the dark theater. I was like, damn, movies can do that. What I was going to be your uh, what was your major before you saw the crocodile go across the slime? What uh, is it going to be? Well, I liked movies. I just didn't realize that I liked RT movies until you were moment. thinking about like uh, I was going know, to become a poli sci. I was going to make birdhouses for a living. I can see that. I can see that. So tell me what this one's about, because so I've heard about it, but I don't know what it's about. So this is a movie about uh, the invasion of Guadalcanal in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Um, an American battalion, or whatever, I don't know military terms precisely, uh, dropped on the island. They fight their way inland. It's a very brutal fight up this hill where the Japanese have a machine gun nest that's just making it impossible for the Americans to get by. Eventually, after much struggle and stress, they do. And then some of the men who made it up the, uh, the hill are moved elsewhere for the next stage of the battle. Some stay to just secure the island. So the, the plot is pretty straightforward. It's just like, how did we take mm-hmm. this crazy, violent machine gun nested hill? Um the tone of the movie is what makes it amazing and it's all about this very as rob says it's beautiful it is shot by john toll uh this tone poem basically about like the place where the natural world and the violent world of humans intersect so it's this this study of like nature and like all of these gorgeous shots of of the south pacific jungle with light filtering down through the trees and into the mist uh intercut with violent explosions and men dying in horrible bloody ways and it's like all Terrence Malick films are studies of how do we go into nature and there see the face of God and this is a specific movie about well sometimes we don't see it because we're busy blowing the face of God to shit and back and that's sort of what the movie is it's like there's this beautiful unfathomably pristine natural setting that because of war is just being turned into this burnt out hell and to me that's like just as a theme that's really powerful and of course just the fact that it's so goddamn beautiful is like honestly all that i need like the fact that it has a great theme and story behind it is is wonderful but to me i just love the fact that it's it's such a beautiful movie i think it's the most accessible terrence malick film um possibly the best i mean it's hard to rank them yeah, yeah, and you mentioned nom- nom- nominated for seven Oscars did not walk away with walk anything away with that any. year. And I mean, I was obviously setting up the Saving Private Ryan joke, but yeah, no, I mean, I was a total, total thin red line partisan that year. I would have given it all of those Oscars. Care important for you to know to the acting in this. We have look, listen to this group of okay. of, of act, actors here: George Clooney, Jared Leto, Adrian Brody, John C. Riley, Woody Harrelson, John Cusack. Uh, ben but Chaplin Elias between Cohen. them who have like I think two lines of dialogue in the entire film Keanu Reeves in there Keanu Reeves is not oh it can't be that good then Nick Nolte and Jim Caviezel really the uh, stars of the film yeah. I would guess yeah it was it was set it was written as an Adrian Brody vehicle yeah that got turned into a Jim Caviezel video, uh, vehicle in the editing room and Adrian Brody learned this fact at the premiere Ouch. Yeah, that, he was, he was sitting there fun. wondering why Jim Caviezel seemed to be getting all the screen time. And then he realized that he'd been reduced to like eight minutes of screen time. Is that how he ended up on Kong? I I would imagine that's, that's Am I exactly right? what Is happened. Is he in that? He is in that. He is, he yeah. is in I know the guy. The guy with the nose, right? The guy with the nose. Nice. Uh, so, Tim, you took you took my number two. I don't but think... Yeah, Rob, tell us tell us a little bit about what you love it. Like, it's your, You obviously think more highly of, of it than I do because you ranked it at number two. 
No, I, I still remember. I've only seen it the, uh, maybe once or twice. I remember just the shots in particular. I don't remember any particular performances from it. Um, what stands out to me is how beautiful it looks, those reeds blowing in the wind. Um, and it, it, I just I just remember it looking just gorgeous. And, would I like um, this movie? I think you I would. I, th- I hope so. Yeah. I think yeah? you would just from an aesthetic perspective. Um, I don't think there's anything Does it there. end well? I like when they end well. We yeah. beat the Japanese. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't know. I'm, I don't want anything to happen to them either. But I think it's full of of, of great acting. Um, yeah. It, what's interesting about all these movies too is there the, that I have. I don't know if this is similar to your list. So it seems like every war movie has to be on the longer side. It's not super long, but all my movies are over over two hours as well. I mean, for for me, the Steel Helmet is like an eighty minute movie. So I've already nice. already blown that one. All right, well, number four, number four then to me, I'm curious. I don't think it'll be on Tim's list. Perhaps a shot on being on Carrie's. Uh, we're back into modern warfare with 2008's Hurt Locker. Nah. We saw this together. Yeah, I liked it, but not enough to make my top five, man. I, I just re- I feel the same way as Carrie on this one, yeah. Okay. Um, this is uh, during the Iraq War, a sergeant uh, assigned uh, to Army Bomb Squad. Um, is put at odds with his squad mates due to his maverick ways of handling his work. Won six Oscars. I forget that. Um, that's probably a probably on the high side. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't remember thinking it's a six Oscar movie. But, um, it was good, but yeah. I don't know about that good. I just remember being uh, my white knuckle yeah. gripping. Yeah, captivated. Yeah, I was so tense the whole movie. And yeah. Catherine Bigelow, who directed this, also Point Break, Zero Dark Thirty, and the upcoming Detroit movie, um, stars Jeremy Rather, Anthony Mackie, Brian Garrity. She managed the tension of that movie so well. Yeah, totally. There's a, there's an opening scene, which I don't want to ruin because it's it's so great. I realize it happens right away. Um, that sets the tone for the movie. That's going to be it's going to be wild a little bit, and uh, the wild nature of the of the lead character Jeremy Renner being this kind of maverick. Um, uh, he loves his job a little bit too much. Um, and I think it deals he, a little he's bit an with adrenaline junkie. Yeah, he's an adrenaline junkie, and it it, it talks about uh, to me it's a, it deals a lot of about um, how do you when you're when you're like that how do you how do you get back to normalcy? Yeah, in in in, in life as well. Um, I think the action's really solid too. That was good. Yeah, was I, good I, movie. I, I remember liking it a lot. Not a classic. Yeah. Not a yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's a, a rock solid piece of cinema. I need to see it again. I haven't seen it since before Zero Dark Thirty, which was definitely my come to Jesus moment with Catherine Bigelow. So I do want to watch it again. At the time, I remember it just being like, this is a solid old school, like meat and potato sort of character study. And I liked it. I liked yeah, it a lot. I agree. Uh, our audience members, Ramon Rodriguez, Joy V. Hill and Jessica Mabry also had it on their list. I care. How about you? Number yeah, three. I, I definitely like that one, but not as much. As I liked the 1987, this is on your list, Tim. Whoa, 87. Good morning, Vietnam. It, this is not on my list. No, but is it, it is because a it's a movie? It, uh, is it because I don't know why it's not on your list, but uh, just beca- just doesn't jingle my bells. Doesn't. It's fine. Oh, like see, because I like happy happy war movies too, and um, so this is directed by Barry Levinson, written by Mitch Markowitz, Robin Williams. I mean. Can't have a just like Kate Winslet. Can't have a bad movie with Robin Williams. And you know, oh his birthday, my! His, before you say anything about Robin Williams, today's his birthday. Oh, oh! Happy so, yeah. birthday, buddy! Now let me tell you about the movie Good Morning Vietnam. <laughs> it's gonna lead to that. And uh, Forrest Whitaker's in it, and there's a few other people. So this takes place. So uh, Robin Williams plays a DJ, and he's shipped from Crete to Vietnam to become. The funny man, like he's a funny guy. He comes and he's a DJ and he he becomes the radio personality for the armed forces. And it's pretty bleak when he comes in to the situation and he turns around the morale uh, of the troops with his own uh, humor and personality, a story that I love. And then he goes out into like to layer on to what I loved about it too. He went off and to um, like leaves to go out and meet with local people that are there who are actually like Vietnamese people that are there and tries to, to uh, you know, start relationships with those people and kind of get beyond the, uh, the, the war element that's within it. So uh, this movie just, I don't know. It's one of those that leaves, leaves you smiling at certain parts and one that I enjoyed when I first saw it. I don't remember much about this other than uh, other than the good morning. Do you want me to do the impression? Yeah, do it. Please do. I can't. Good morning, Vietnam. That's how he does it. 
that's was that it that that lacks the the fiery like enthusiasm of Robin Williams at his most manic. Ah, uh, it's his birthday. I it don't want to. Uh, I don't like, want to. Uh, you don't want to overshadow it. On his that's right. For sure. Yeah. So yeah, it was my number three. I it's one that I remember and I want to watch it. I think I'd like it if I saw it again too. I think it would stand the test of time for me. You know, it's it's a real crowd pleaser. I mean, I haven't seen it in a long time. I don't really remember much of anything that's not Robin Williams specific performance. So I don't know that I really feel like I could commit to an opinion on it, but it is definitely a good crowd pleaser. Thanks. And Thanks. I think it was I think it was a pretty big hit back when uh, in, when it came out too. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. Yeah, I think a lot of people will like ones where you can turn some of the negative into the positive too and all the stuff that he did. So I'm sure we're going to come to a real uplifting one with your number three, Tim. Yes. So turning the negative into the positive, uh, here's a story about how a teenage boy dies horribly. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You're <laughs> and, selling me. And is then a corpse. The end. The end. Uh, oh, yeah. So this That's is, my number two. This is uh, 1930s All Quiet on the Western Front. Oh, tell me about this it one. It is a Best Picture winner. It is the third Best Picture winner, directed by Lewis Milestone, released by Universal. Um, so this is, for all intents and purposes, the first uh, war film of the sound period. It's a story about uh, a German a group of friends in Germany, uh, just boys, high school boys, who get very like excited by all of the patriotic fervor and propaganda about like this war is going to be a great way for you to prove your manhood. And you know, the, the traditional story that we always hear from every nation that the war will be over by Christmas. So like they're, they're going to just sign up to go have a merry adventure and, uh, and go off to war. And what happens to them is that they, uh, they discover that war is a vile, despicable suck hole in which everything is bad and Mm -hmm. they die. And then they're dead because Wait, like all of them. Uh, I'm trying to remember if any made if like seriously. I don't remember if any named characters lived to the end of All Quiet at the Western Front. A oh. um, lot of death. Uh, very very. The famous. I mean, spoiler alert. But uh, the last second to last scene of the movie is this extremely famous, extremely beautiful, extremely heartbreaking death scene. I don't want to describe it because like it's so good. And if you Awful. haven't seen the film, I want you to experience it. Uh, well, it's. I mean, it's 1930, so there's not much they can show. They have to do everything elliptically. Uh, but it is it's a mo- it's a moment that'll that'll get your heartstrings going pretty hard. Uh, so yeah, so it's it's on my list for a few different reasons. One is that it really is the first war epic of the sound era, and it takes huge advantage of that. Uh, in 1930, sound recording was still like this really tenuous, we don't know what we're doing sort of technology, and along comes this movie that gets very nearly all of its effectiveness because they again they can't show combat really like they can't show people erupting in blood they can't show yeah. with bayonets sticking out of their chest so everything about the terror and chaos and just the pure hell of war combat has to be done through the soundtrack yeah. so it has this extremely immersive soundtrack like i i don't know if how well you remember the opening sequence from saving private ryan but it's it's sort of the forerunner yeah. to that and that like it's just so involving and the, the soundtrack just bowls you over captivating just, right from the start yeah it's like it just it it freaks you out like you're you're there like you can understand how upsetting it must be to be in that environment so that's a big part of it uh and the other part is i think it's kind of amazing for a 1930 american film to set itself with a bunch of german boys and like be sympathetic towards their experience and that's not totally rare there's a lot of films towards the late th- uh, 20s that are about the european experience of the war that do look at um, Germans. Uh, I know John Ford's uh, Four Sons is a prominent example of that. But it just it does strike me as being a better way to mount this very humanist anti-war argument. And it is certainly an extremely strident anti-war film. If you're going to say, these guys were our enemies, but look at it. They're suffering. They're scared. They're little boys. They don't want to be there. And they got lied to to get them there. And like that, I think, is... It speaks to a level of sympathy that makes the movie a lot more powerful, I think, than if it had been the same story about like a bunch of American soldiers mm-hmm. who got who got stuck out there. Uh, really powerful, really sobering. There's there's not a fun moment in it. Like it's it's a very long movie, but yeah, it doesn't sound like it, and it's very sober and dry. I mean, I don't want to say there's no fun. Like they have moments where they go out into the local towns and like experience something of life, but it is a very very draining film, but in the best possible way. So. I think there was a shift at some point, you know, um, I, I don't know if I think maybe during Vietnam or maybe World War Two, uh, probably more World War Two, where Hollywood um, uh, was was targeted to uh, 
be more pro war, not pro war, but to, to motivate people to want to sign up and to uh, to to be to, to to go over and fight uh, and uh, support the war. That a little absolutely bit more. happened. There's a very famous uh, the specific movie Sergeant York, which came out in 1941 before the U.S. was in the war. Uh, very famously, it was like designed to encourage young men to join the army to like prove that you can be a great man and that you can prove yourself on the battlefield. So yeah, no, there was definitely um, for several years in the 40s, Hollywood was like officially pro-war. Yeah, so it's interesting how it changed from the first installment uh, being anti-war, and then the propaganda films kind of peppered throughout, um, kind of World War II era, maybe even, and then Vietnam. I think wars kind of more, then shifting back to anti-war kind of film filmmaking afterwards. Yeah, I mean it's it's easier to make an anti-war film when we're not at war. I think just because Hollywood is so sensitive to public sentiment, like they don't want to do anything that's going to upset people. Uh, and really, Vietnam films did not come out until Vietnam was over. There, there are very few Vietnam films made during Vietnam. Like, they had to wait until it was safe. Well, speaking of, of films that I wanted uh, that, to me, <laughs> drudge up an anti-war sentiment because I would want no part in this situation. This is um, your number three. This is my number three. I, I don't think you've seen it, Care, Tim. I don't think you're fond of this movie. I'm talking about 2014's Fury. No. I, I'm not particularly fond of it, no. All right. It's uh, two hours, 14 minutes, IMDb high, 7.6, Rotten Tomatoes, 77%, directed by David, uh, is it Ayer, Tim? David Ayer? I think it's Ayer. Yeah, Ayer. Um, I, I enjoyed End of Watch. That's pretty much the only David Ayer movie that I've I've liked other than this one. This is about- You did not like Suicide Squad. I did not like Suicide Squad. I like seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger- uh, in things, so sabotage was passable for me, but uh, everything I wanted, else. I wanted to set sabotage on fire. I swear to God. But anyway, Fury, <laughs> Fury is much better than sabotage. So, Kara, let me set this up for you. Yeah. Uh, someone who hasn't seen it, um, a grizzled tank commander played by Brad Pitt. We're talking. It's the end of. T- it's already sounded it's good. Com- coming towards the end of World War Two, nineteen forty-five ish. Okay. Uh, maybe, um, but they're not done yet. So. Uh, Brad Pitt and his tr- uh, his troop of, of tank commando or the his tank group um, are a man short. They just lost someone. They've been probably at war for three years okay. or, or so. They're they're grizzled. They're, they're done. Yeah. Um, they're over it. They're, um, in walks in. They need a they need a new person. Um, like a nineteen year old Logan Lerman uh, from the high school kid that, that that movie that we just absolutely love. I'm blanking on the name. Perks of being a wallflower. Perks of being a wallflower kid. Walks in, so you wait. Which kid though? The guy with the dark hair. The, the main the main lead. character. The lead. Oh yeah, yeah, I do like him. So yeah. he um, he gets tapped to join Brad Pitt's oh, crew gosh. of grizzled He's grizzled like baby men. Baby face, little that, thing that features Michael Pena, John Bernthal from The Walking Dead that you know him from. The, yeah, the, is he who is he in The Walking Dead? He, well, I don't want to spoil it. Uh, the is he the one that loses he, his he arm? He is John Dead. I don't know what that means. The, I was just saying, like the Don governor. Is the name, Don is the name of someone. I haven't seen The Walking Dead. It, it's a joke that didn't just work. Tell me, what does no, it look John, like? John Bernthal is the 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 cops nemesis in the first season. Oh, that the, guy. The I will tell who, you what happens. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then Shia LaBeouf. Got so it. they don't want this young guy. They think he's kind of bad luck. He doesn't know what he's doing. The movie kind of I, for me, Tim. I don't know about you, but it it really is. Uh, the point of view is from Logan Lerman's character. Is you have these people who've been. A little bit have lost their mind. Yeah, to a point. I mean, you're, they've been fighting war. They've seen it. They've seen it. Uh, terrible things. Terrible probably. things. They're one of the few people who have survived. They've almost uh, developed this cachet of being super lucky and uh, indestructible. Um, but they're they're done with it, and yeah. they have this one mission left, and it's kind of an impossible mission um, to have to t- go through. Germany, the middle of Germany, or whatever, by themselves, pretty much, and take over an you entire. You already said this, but which war? Are we this is about World here? War Two. World War Two. Okay, got it. So very much an R-rated movie. There's a there's a lot of it's it's very is there brutal. Any romance? Um, there is actually a little bit. There's mm-hmm. there's a really uh, I think it's a good scene where they stop over in a in a town that's been decimated by 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 war mm-hmm. and they get some provisions and um, Logan Lerman kind of. Yeah, Did I, do I, I, don't want to I was going to say, I, I have a, a, a friend of mine who wants to sit on Shia LaBeouf's face in this particular movie. I don't know if that counts as romance or not. <laughs> I don't think it is. That's called horror. That's horror right there. Because he, he's so like dirty and like scraggly Yucky, beardy. And I'm always yeah. like very, very confused and put off when I hear this. But, you know. I agree. These are That's people who I would not want to hang out with, but it's not their fault. Like they've been put in this situation and just been have the tortures of war have corrupted them 
to a point. And Brad Pitt is is this interesting character because he still has he's he's on both sides. He wants to toughen up this Logan Lerman, yeah. But at the same time, he's also lost his um, the marbles. Yeah, uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, sure. he's, he's just they're all just a little bit off. And it's there's this yeah this tent scene where they visit this um, this town and try to get get some food and some some things like that too. I I really liked it. Um, it sounds kind of good the way you're describing it, sort of. And it just it goes back to show I think again in, from an anti-war sentiment. I can't imagine these people co- going back to a normal life after having lived and seen what they what they have. So I I really like this. Um, I'm a uh, uh, alone with this with audience member R- Ramon Rodriguez, the only other uh, audience member who who had this on their list too. But I, I really enjoyed uh, Fury. Yeah, All right. I mean, I honestly, I don't remember what I disliked about it. I just remember having a sort of mildly negative response. So I, I don't really remember. But we'll assume that you're wrong and I'm right because I am the critic and you are the, the whatever you are. Film school dropout. Film school dropout. Possible casual movie goer. We're, dep- we're uh, deciding Depending, whether we should trade. Last week yeah. seemed like it was definitely pushing us in a certain direction. And this, we'll see where my uh, number two pushes me with the 2001 Enemy at the Gates. Huh? I had I a not feeling seen this movie, so I cannot. What? Cannot oh Wait, my gosh! That's Tim. A pr- that's surprising. When Carrie said though that uh, there would be some sort of romance Sexiness. war, sexy war. This is the, what you know. I, I knew immediately that she would have <laughs> so Enemy yeah. at the Gates. This is so. This also made my I think top five romance and date movie. I mean, this is made probably a few of my lists. Uh, it made one of my steamiest uh, romantic scene lists. So, so, so is it Jude Law with Ed Harris or Jude Law with Joseph Fiennes? Uh, Ed Harris. Ed okay, Harris. Okay. Or no, it's Good. Ed Burns, though. It's Ed Burns. Right? No. Is it? Oh, Ed Harris. Who's Ed Burns? Is Ed, he the guy Ed with Burns the cigar? Is the he is an he's actor. In he's, he's, not, he's in Private Ryan. And he's not nearly as good an actor as Ed Harris. Never mind. Not Never mind. A sexy an actor. I, I, I think. I think what you missed. I think what Tim was trying to imply was who does who does um, Wh- which who of does, the two gentlemen does Jude Law have his torrid affair with? The the Ed Harris character. Okay. Good. Yeah, yeah, and it, a third person is Rachel Vice. Oh, that they have a the deal for you? Nice. Yeah, I, I, like I, did, I knew I that like was sweet. The deal for you. Ways. I know. So it's also so good. So it's uh, written uh, and directed by Jean Jacques Anand. Is that right? <laughs> uh, we will say that that's all right because I don't really know uh, Jean Jacques Anand. Ja, ja, yeah, you know. Jean ja, Jacques Gabor. Jaja Gabor is, uh, yeah, that's from Green Acres, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Jaja Gabor is the woman I in Green Ava, Acres. I think Ava Gabor is the woman. Oh, damn it. Okay, so anyway, let's just move along here. So, yes. Enemy of the Gates. Move, Enemy of the Gates. So in the winter of 1942, the German and Russian armies meet in the Battle of, battle of Stalingrad, and it's one of their more vicious battles that they're engaged in. So there is this top-notch uh, sniper who is played... Um, uh, but who's the top notch sniper played by? Jude, oh, Jude, Jude Law. Law. Jude Law, sorry. And so he's taken all these people down and they catch wind of it that there's this top notch sniper and then they send in Ed Harris to combat this. And it's a it becomes a standoff situation of of, uh, of arms. And so it was just a really intense, intense movie coupled with the romance with Rachel Weiss. I saw this in the theater and it was... Steamy with a capital S. And uh, I really like this movie. I think you would like it, Tim. You'd be like, oh, Carrie, probably. But it's steamy and definitely a popcorn well, movie. I'll tell you, as I'm looking at the cast list for this movie, I'll tell you one thing that definitely gets me a bit hot under the collar. Bob Hoskins as Nikita Khrushchev. Like, that's yeah, that's some casting in a half is that, right there. Is that sarcastic heat? Or I know. Real well, heat? I mean, it's not actual sexual ardor. Right. But it kind of is. And it's kind Bob of? Bob Hoskins playing Nikita Khrushchev. I can't picture kind of his face. But yeah, I'm going to look uh, him up He's afterwards. the detective in Roger Rabbit. Oh, Tim, there's no heat under your collar for as him. As Nikita Khrushchev. No, as the, char- as the casting choice as for <laughs> future premiere of Russia, <laughs> Nikita Khrushchev. Okay. That- I, liked, I liked this movie. So I, I, I bought tickets to see this with my dad because we... I'm, I'm, I like sniper movies. I think yeah. it's a really interesting uh, concept. I remember this movie being very slow. It's very slow, but, you know, in, in retrospect... Slow I would, is key in this movie. Well, slow is important because I think that actually adds to the drama of being a sniper. A sniper is you have to be really 
careful patient patient it's all about patience and they talk a lot about in the movie so the fact that it's slow i think actually works for the but when i took my dad i wanted it to be you know like combat was it awkward no it wasn't it's that scene that you're making it a bigger it's a good i actually think it is a fine scene yeah it's a very memorable scene the one you're describing um but no i don't yeah it's not it's not awkward so so in this moment in time my (laughs) image is rachel vice on top of jude law with a strap on that's actually exactly. How, so you have seen this I? too. Okay. You have you seen it. Me. So anyway, that's my number two, and you have to go see it. I'm challenging you to go All see. Right. I'm going to go become a Patreon too, and, and I, get you to see it. I have a feeling now of where you're going with number one, and I'm going to save that in my mind right now. But the way you're going right now is going in a particular direction. Is it a I good think, direction? I think you're going to. I think you're going to surprise others, but not me. I'm, I'm ready for your number one later when we get there. Are you going to? You'll be honest if. Yeah, um, I'll write it down right. on my phone and show it to you. Okay, later. that sounds good. So, Tim, this is your number two, right? So this is my number two, and uh, we have now reached the point where I will not have any more English language films on my list. So I'm sure you guys have both seen both of my top two. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but let's Tell start right more. now with my number two, uh, which is the 1966 Italian Algerian co production directed by, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce his name, Gilo Pantacorvo. Uh, it is the film The Battle of Algiers, which is a very, very politicized movie. For Pantacorvo, was a very, very political filmmaker. Uh, it is set in the uh, French Algerian War when the um, Algerian people were struggling to attain their independence from France. And it is a film about freedom fighters in the city of Algiers doing whatever it takes to stop the French, to distract the French, to move them away. Uh, It is basically a film that is pro-terrorist, to put it bluntly. Mm -hmm. Uh, The freedom fighters in Algeria are using terror tactics because that's what they have to do because they are facing a considerably better uh, equipped fighting force. Uh, so already right there, we've got like, this is a movie that's playing with fire and it does it in a really good way. Uh, also the movie, if you've ever seen a film period, whether it's a war film or not, that uses what looks like documentary footage to create the sense of like realism and like, movement. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like that's where this li- that literally started with this movie. Uh, it looks, it's meant to look like it has newsreel footage like what was actually happening in Algiers and it's all staged I think it's all staged mm-hmm. some of my some of it might actually be documentary footage do they uh, use an iPhone or they they use actually a um shit the I'm joke the too. joke is dead I killed, I killed the joke because I was going to go for a uh, <laughs> GoPro I was gonna yeah, go going to go for GoPro but then I forgot what GoPros were called <laughs> I'm having a bad night there's a storm here it's throwing me off my game uh, I, anyway. you're scared I get it but it's uh no it's a uh, shot in this really like rugged handheld like news journalist fashion uh to sort of create the sense like yes this is what's going on this is what the war is actually about these are the Mm -hmm. actual stakes these are the actual people so it's really really heavily realistic and again just like so incensed about politics uh ponte corvo's films are all of that he was if i'm not mistaken a doctrinaire marxist so he was very much invested in like what are the the lower classes going to do to throw off the yoke of capitalist oppressors so it's this movie that's like unabashedly like fuck the colonial French yeah they deserve to be blown up up with the the radicals uh and just this amazing when you're watching it even if you don't have that context as of course most of us 21st century English speakers don't really know what was going on in in the French Algerian war uh it's just so exciting like exciting is the wrong word for it but like it's very visceral it has this really strong energy and just as you're watching it it's hard not to get swept up by just the forcefulness of it and um, yeah really incredible movie i mean it sounds on paper kind of like oh eat your medicine it's this mid-century art film that has like you know this weird cinematography thing going on but it's like it's legit it is a feel it in your gut sort of movie so yeah rob i think would like that he decided that he was going to become a marxist uh after that movie with the guy with from breaking bad Remember that Trumbo? was the Marxist Trumbo Trumbo Trumbo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You remember? You're like, yeah, I kind of get that. I get that. No, thing. I understand. Mar- I that Marxism vibe. on paper makes makes sense in practice. It's uh, it doesn't. Uh, or I guess that's more communism that I feel that way about. Um, yeah. Anyway, moving yeah. on. Throw on your political views yeah. out there, Rob. So this takes it to your number two. No, we're skipping. We me going number right, two. Oh, right, your number right one. To your number, right. right to your number one. I'm oh, it's to my, my number one. one. Oh my gosh. And I okay. have it. I have it on my phone. So if you need if you need a reminder, I've got. I don't think that you have it right. Mm-hmm. It is my favorite. Nope. Okay. I thought that's where you're going with it. I was going to do that, 
Rob had atonement written down, which makes my honorable mention. I'll show my, you my computer later, uh, which also the notebook does as well. There's some more there. I uh, think calling the notebook a war film is definitely, <laughs> definitely reaching. So it is a bit, which is why it made honorable mention. Forrest Gump, Atonement, The Notebook, uh, all made my honorable mentions. <laughs> I love those movies. But anyway, so my number one is intense and it's very war and it's amazing and it's saving private ryan finally i kind of i knew it i knew it did you yeah i just thought you were going a weird way with the romance like you needed romance in every romance is saving private ryan for me Mm -hmm. i mean matt damon was in it it's my number one as well high five is it really absolutely oh so oh okay so i saw this in theaters not your number one obviously tim i saw this in theaters wept just wept. So when you were talking about the score earlier uh, from uh, the opening scene, literally, so I saw this in theaters with my friend Tracy and her mom. So I don't even know how old I was in 98. Not very old. And uh, all three of us were just weeping together in a corner like in this theater. Like the whole theater was weeping. Uh, directed by Steven Spielberg, who can always uh, bring bring it. And then this is also written by Robert Rodet too, right? Rodat? Is that right? That that gentleman whose name we haven't figured out how to pronounce. Yes. Robert R. Uh, Robbie is R. Robbie R. So this stars Tom Hanks. This is a huge cast too. Matt Damon, Tom Sizemore is in this. Ed Burns, Barry Pepper is in this. There's a bunch of other folks that are in it too. V- very young Vin Diesel. Very Vin Diesel. young Nathan Oh Fillion yeah, Vin Diesel's in it. in it too. Giovanni. Giovanni Ravisi, right? Yeah. I just pulled that name out of nowhere. Uh, Jer- Jeremy Davies is in it. Also him. Uh, there's Are there any ladies in this? Uh, nope. Only in uh, there's like two ladies. One is the mother of the little kid that they rescue in the village, oh, and one yeah. is oh, I think we see the Ryan family mother in like one shot. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I have, this movie has always stuck with me, left me with like a, a nighttime stomach ache for like ten years following this movie. Like wake up and have bad dreams about it. So followed the following the Allied invasion of Normandy, two brothers are left behind. Uh, then they go and it kind of captures then another brother that's left, left behind. They find out that there's this fourth fourth man, this fourth brother who's missing on the French countryside and a rescue mission ensues to go and get him out and to bring him safely home. So opening scene of like this group storming, like they're coming in on the waters, like coming in on the beach and it, become, it becomes very graphic uh, very fast and um, they're going out to essentially save. Yeah, Private you've Ryan. you've got to give the first thirty minutes oh, something, right? Right, the Tim. Opening, you've, the opening yeah. twenty, whatever it is, twenty five minutes is just like beyond brilliant. It's the best combat sequence ever filmed. Period. Yeah, like, it's period. it's intense. Yeah, no, I and this movie is one that is always stuck with me. A tough to watch, uh, but just such a such a great action packed movie. And and uh, yeah, that's why it made my number one. And I, all my movies are war movies, man. For for me, why it, why it takes the top spot over th- the Thin Red Line in particular is the combat scenes. Uh, that first 30 minutes just alone. Um, but it does, it, you mentioned this too, Tim, with the Thin Red Line, is that it, you have a lot of characters dealing with a lot of people, and the Thin Red Line really ends up focusing really on the two. Here I get, I, I every character is developed pretty well here, and I care, I care enough about... Who do you care most about? I care about oh it's hard um, I care about Tom Hanks I care about Tom Hanks quite a bit too the most uh, the other person who jumps to mind other than Matt Damon who, who's the, the obvious choice there is Adam Goldberg's character there's a scene there towards the end there's also the coward um, the coward is stands that out by, to me uh, what's, that, is that by I don't remember the actors yeah. Jer- Jeremy Davies oh that's Jeremy oh, okay. Davies yes so yeah, he the, stands like the little bookworm guy Yes, and there's we've all I can I think I can f- safely talk a little bit about this movie, but there's a scene where it's a hand to hand knife uh, oh, yeah. fight with Adam Goldberg and um, Jeremy Jeremy Davies. Is that what we said? Jer- Jeremy Davies. Jeremy Davies has the opportunity to help his friend, and it is the creepiest knife scene because there it's give or take who's going to is it the german is it going to be adam goldberg's character who's going to actually uh, uh win out in this and they're pushing the knife towards one another and it's this the the knife just goes in so slowly, slowly. Uh, and that so that dramatic bastard and that's, coward yeah go a, ahead tim that's not even the creepy part the creepy part to me is that the german is whispering a german lullaby well oh yeah. oh yeah i forgot about the well german he sees lullaby. the he sees the jewish star oh. i think if i recall on on uh, that adam goldberg is wearing so it you know it we're it it's it's on v- that particular scene on many levels is very dramatic and 
heart wrench. There's so many heart wrenching things here. There's a there's character studies. Every character gets a little bit of time. Yeah. Great combat scenes. That opening thirty minutes. Yeah, it's just this. When I think war movies, this, this is, is the movie Kate, the that, first thing that just comes obviously to comes to mind. I'm gonna for have me. a nighttime stomach ache again, just so you know. Yep. Uh, so that is both of our number ones, Tim. Yeah, so that I, kicks I gotta, it to you. I mean, I, I I will say this about the movie. I think the opening combat sequence is amazing. I think the closing combat sequence is not as amazing, but still very good. And everything in between, I just, I don't buy the screenplay. Like the script for that movie just does not do it for me. And, and Rob, you mentioned specifically the character development is part of what you love. The character development is like a thing that I think specifically isn't there. But... You maybe know. it's because you love so maybe it's partially because you know all these are such big names like for me these are all ca- actors that I love so I'm just waiting for what's going to happen to them sure. like I already love them before the movie even starts had you put like no name people in there that I well, needed they, to they build were. a, a that's, love like, for that's part of why they were cast actually is because for the most part they were not recognizable in 1998 yeah Tom Hanks hadn't really made it then no he, so. he it was like this they didn't understand how to pronounce his name or anything. It's like Hanks. <laughs> Tom Hanks, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, agree to disagree on this one. I, that's totally legit. What's your uh, number one then? Well, well, my number one is a film that I think does have some really good character development because it's in French and everything is better when it's in French. Obviously. This is the 1932 film Wooden Crosses directed by Raymond Bernard, uh, which is a direct, specific, conscious answer to another film on my list, All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, basically, the French film industry saw this film come out as a huge international hit, and they were like, well, damn it. We actually went to war. The Americans, like, they, they left their country to go to war, but we lived through it. It happened in our backyard. Uh, so they made the French version of All Quiet on the Western Front and impossibly did a better job of it. Uh, very similar concept, very similar material to Old Quiet. Um, a group of young French soldiers who are promised this is going to be a great way to go out in the world and make your way and become a man. Uh, join the war, find that the war is just the worst thing they have ever experienced. And I don't think they all die. I think that it has a lower body count than Old Quiet okay. on the Western Front, if my memory Good. serves. Um, and it is, I think, in part because the French did live through the war. The war was happening in the places where this film was shot. Like they actually had like war footage of it. Um, I think it just has a much more like immediate visceral, horrible, like horrible feeling to it. And it is in fact um, shot using a lot of the techniques that had been developed in the twenties to shoot uh, German expressionism. So it is descended from horror cinema in a way. So it's all of these like, horribly dark scenes and like scenes with a lot of contrast of black and white again as with all quiet scenes that use sound in these really aggressive ways to just make us feel very like terrified and nauseous unlike all quiet on the western front it can show a little bit more i mean you're still not going to see disembowelings or beheadings but you do get a little bit more sense of like what is the human physical cost of combat um so that's that's part of why i bump it above uh, all quiet. Uh, the other part is just, I think it's just a more immediate, it's shorter, it's more intense, it's more focused. Uh, and I think that's part of what I, I, I have to put it at number one for that. It's just this very compact, I mean, it's not short, it's not like a short movie, but it's like this very intense burst of horror and rage at what the war did. Like, what did the war do yeah. to us in France? Um and it's, it's probably the most upsetting anti-war film I've ever seen. And that's ultimately, that's what I was looking for. Like my list is all about different ways of being like anti-war. And I think this is the one that does it for me. It's the one that makes me feel the sickest in my stomach about what war is. Has hmm. anybody else seen this movie but you? No one. I okay, own I the so. only print in my basement. <laughs> I, I, I thought so. I jealously guarded. No, uh, it was released some years ago on Criterion's Eclipse label. So it is available on DVD. Uh, if you subscribe to Hulu or uh, Filmstruck, I suspect you might be able to find it there on the Criterion channel. Uh, totally worth it, the effort it takes to see it if you want to be horribly depressed and sad. Yeah, I'm one. always I'm always looking for that. And who's you, not? And- <laughs> you make a good point too. I think uh, for our listeners, uh, we did consider trying to get a little bit more of a well-rounded uh, group in here for this one. Obviously, for some of our selections, maybe like a, a George W. or something like that to round out uh, <laughs> our group in here. But our yeah. selections probably indicate things well, the about thing is, ourselves. There's, so. there's just not that many like aggressively pro-war movies. No, there really aren't. There really aren't. 
But uh, well, I thought we had a lot of nice contrasting picks as well too. So it was true. it was good. And speaking good of our listeners, let's go to our audience's top five. Every week we ask you to share your picks and thoughts for a chance to win a free Amazon movie rental. Um, with that, uh, our top five. Um, Top five war movies selected by our audience go in this order. At number f- tied for number five, uh, we have The Hurt Locker and Full Metal Jacket. So, oh, Full Metal Jacket, that's so, a good, yeah, good call. Yeah, some. that was on my honorable mentions as well too. I had that. I had that written down. That one stands out to me more the first half of Full Metal Jacket than the second half for me. But I am I am one of the very few people who actually likes the second half of that movie better. It's wow, not a common opinion. Uh, number four, We Were Soldiers, which I don't think I've seen. I have definitely not seen it. Um, I think that's a 2002 film with Will Gibson, if my memory serves. Yeah, I remember the the cover, uh, stalking, stalking it when I worked at Blockbuster or wherever it was on the Blockbuster shelves. But yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember picking it up or being compelled to want to see it. So that's one I have to check out. Um, t- uh, number three, Black Hawk Down, also oh, yeah. one that doesn't. I don't know why oh, that I doesn't stand that. out to me. That's with that guy with the squinty. No, I, I know it. Yeah. It's just I don't know why that one never really grabbed me. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. For me, that one has a little, and I don't want to besmirch the the listeners and readers who who picked that one. Uh, for me, that one's a little bit too much. Like, I don't want to say it's a pro war film, but it's a little war is cool ish, and it doesn't necessarily give that much of a shit about the the people who are dying. I would well, say. A war, uh, war movie about more about pacifism in a recent recent film, which I was surprised to see make number two, uh, being so recent. It's Hacksaw Ridge. I as soon as you said pacifism, I was like, wow, that is a recent recent ass movie. Cool. I, I, I feel have no, I, no thoughts I'm, about that, but it's. I'm it just, just I'm I'm yeah. surprised to see it so high so soon. Yeah, for for sure. And at number one, probably no surprise uh, by a, over a two to one margin over number two. Um, Saving Private Ryan. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, no, no surprise there. And every week we also select one winner. Our winner this week, um, randomly drawn, was Stevie. Stevie had uh, selected uh, The Thin Red Line, uh, Yv- Yvonne's Childhood, uh, okay. Grave of the Fireflies at number three for, for Stevie, Grand Illusion at number two, and number one for Stevie, Lawrence of Arabia. I like that Stevie makes me look like a populist with my picks. Those are all great <laughs> movies. Uh, not... Not 100% sure that Grave of the Fireflies passes the smell test for me as a war film, but I love so he, those movies. All I was going to I was gonna mention Stevie earlier because I really liked the way he did it um, as well. He selected his war movies. He went by, he went on TMDB and just saw everything flagged as, as how TMDB flagged it as if they flagged it as a war movie. Okay. So some, he mentioned that there were some interesting selections that uh, TMDB had that qualified, but uh, nonetheless, at least he had a, a thing he stuck with. Stevie, shoot us an email at contact at alternate.com for details on how to claim your free movie rental. If you want to win a free movie like Stevie, be on the lookout for a spoiler alert or top five movie posts on Facebook and Twitter. Share your favorite picks. Thanks again for listening. Check us out on social media. Go to our Facebook page, like it. Uh, Twitter, we're posting things out there all the time. Alternateending.com is where you can find all of our latest podcasts, uh, reviews, blogs, and more. Subscribe to our podcasts and iTunes. Um, and Google Play, wherever you listen to pod, uh, podcasts. Be sure to go out if you're if you're listening. Uh, leave us a review. Carrie's been pushing that a lot lately. I uh, have not. She gets very excited every time. Leave me alone. Uh, every time someone does that. And be sure to tune in for our next show, where in our uh, sh- which will sure sure be a surefire hit um, in preparation for that with the Emoji Movie. We're going to be doing every, everyone's our- most anticipated film of the summer. <laughs> We're going to be doing our top five emotional roller coasters. So uh, quite quite the good tie in there with the Emoji Movie. I, I so, don't know if there is such a thing as a good tie in with the Emoji yeah, Movie, but we yeah. certainly did our best. Yeah, it's the best we could do. So we will we will catch top you then. Top five movies whose very concept makes you want to cut your face off is not a good list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see you all next week.